I'm Sarah Louise Young and I'm here with a show called An Evening Without Kate Bush. We are at the Cheltenham Everyman. When did the show came about? So to tell you about the show, I have to go back a few years before that because I made it with an amazing collaborator called Russell Lucas. Um, and he and I had already made a show together about Julie Andrews called Julie Madly Deeply. And I'd, I'd sort of put this show together with Michael Ralston, my musical collaborator. And Russell had come in and, and turned it from what we call a Wikipedia Live, which was a very boring version of the story, into this wonderful kind of cabba play. So he brought this wonderful kind of maverick spirit to what could have been a very boring life story and challenged us to make really interesting theatre. So he brought all of that, I brought kind of my cabaret experience and we loved working together so much that we kind of thought there must be something else that we can make together. So initially the idea for this was his. I was a childhood fan of Kate Bush but he was, he was the one that brought the idea. And we started playing around with it and we did some time in the room um, with Matthew Floyd Jones, who was one half of Frisky and Manish. It was going to be a two-person show to begin with, and it had lots of different incarnations. And then just at the point when we were going to seriously think about staging it, mm -hmm. Kate Bush announced her return to live performance for the first time in over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we just thought, we can't. We can't do this now. People will think we are jumping on the bandwagon, that we're kind of being parasitic, that we're exploiting the moment. And we were really kind of heavy-hearted because we loved the idea of the show. Mm -hmm. So we just, that was 2014, we just let it lie. And then after a couple of years, we kept thinking, mm, yeah, it's still a great idea. So it ended up being made for 2019, mm -hmm. and we did it as Free Fringe. It was uh, deliberately lo-fi, all the backing tracks came from like Sunfly Karaoke, there were 79p each, we made all the props and costumes ourselves, and it was a massive, like, standing room only hit. And we were about to tour and then COVID happened. So it's been a long time coming to be back on tour, but we're now about 180 shows in mm -hmm. and it's been to Australia and it's going back out to Australia next year. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a really fun show to do because no two performances are the same. Mm -hmm. So it's the perfect alchemy for me between something that's made with, with love and danger, which are my two favourite ingredients for mm -hmm. all theatre. And tell me about some of the uh, earlier reactions of the show. From the audiences? Mm -hmm. um, oh, we knew we were making something that had a baked-in fan base because there are huge fans of Kate Bush. But we knew that we wanted to make something that people who didn't know her work, maybe even didn't like her work, but were being dragged along by fish people, her super fans. So we... We spent a lot of time really trying loads of different versions of the show. So the very, very, very first sharing that we did back at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, the audience response was good, but we knew we hadn't quite got it right. We wanted people to, to see something they'd never seen before. And then I would say from that time onwards, we, the biggest response we get after the show, because I come out and meet people, people will say, that is not what I was expecting, mm. but I loved it. So we get laughter, we get tears. I'm amazed how many people will come and tell me very personal stories about loved ones, people who've died and it's the first time they've come to a piece of theatre or their father was a massive Kate Bush fan and they felt his presence in the room. So it's a huge privilege doing the show because when you're dealing with music or a body of work, which people already have an emotional connection to, those people bring that with them into the theatre space. So that incredible privilege to be working with that material means that the responses can be quite huge and mm -hmm. quite emotional um, and like the other day two women happened to come dressed as different Kate Bushes and I got them both up to do some backing vocals and at the end of the show they were swapping phone numbers and they've now they're going out to dinner and they've become friends so yeah. lovely things like that but it's definitely a show that encourages people to let themselves go and um, be very joyful and playful but also it's a show that often it makes people quite emotional. I get a lot of hugs mm. after the show. <laughs> I get a lot of hugging. You mentioned you took it to Australia. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, I got invited to take it to the Adelaide Cabaret Festival, which is the most, um, it's the only festival like this in the entire world. Mm. It's a fully curated festival. Um, it changes its artistic directorship every few years. And it's the fourth time I've been out there. I mean, I'm massively privileged to go out there. And um, 
it was the first time of taking it out of the country. So obviously there's a lot of cultural overlap between Australia and England, but it was still that feeling of even more intrepid than usual, not being sure how the reaction would be. Um, but they were lovely and we took it to New Zealand and um, I went to Tasmania, which my maternal grandparents are from and had never been there before. It was great, it was lovely. And I'm going back when it's actually been warm. And uh, when you were writing the script and you were doing research for the script, did you show it to anyone in particular? So Russell and I always do early sharings. We are big believers in putting your work, especially if your work is interactive and immersive, you have to put it in front of an audience and you have to do it before you're comfortable. It's like ripping the band-aid off and when I'm directing the same thing, always invite people but you've got to invite the right people. You want people who are allies and supporters of your work, who are going to be honest and we're very careful to solicit specific feedback. We usually ask people, what did you experience? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? Rather than just a general, hey, what do you think? Um, I mean, Russell and I, when we worked together in the making room, and we, he's not the director, we say we made the show together, mm -hmm. and we experiment with things, we will set each other um, improvisations and tasks, and so there's bits of the show that Russell came up with, there's bits of the show I came up with, most of it I can't remember who came up with what, it's an amalgamation of our experimentation. But we, we got an audience in, and there was no lighting, no, no, nothing special. I mean, we had, a, we had a whiteboard behind us that said star cloth, you know, and like he's going, and now there'll be a blackout. So you're really exposed. But if you take all the bells and whistles away and it works, then you know you've got your storytelling right. So we, that's, and that's a no brainer for me. I've never made a piece of work and not invited people in, usually about halfway through or two thirds of the way through, just to check that you are heading in the right direction before you ask people to pay to come and see your work. And how do you think the progression of the show has gone in the number of performances that you've done? So the first six previews I would say was the biggest change, like the order of songs, the choice of songs, and there's a moment towards the end, the whole show is a gradual build, an invitation for the audience to join in, and it can be as little or as much as you want, like the first invitation is for the audience to howl, and then I won't spoil the ending of the show, but there is a bigger invitation at the end of the show. Um, and there was a moment where I, I knew I wanted the audience to, to be involved. And I, in early previews, was asking them to dance. And then we were in a preview, I think it was like the fifth show in Birmingham, and just something wasn't right. And suddenly I realised, ah, I need to shift the dynamic. I need to dance like nobody's watching. And if that makes them feel like they want to, then great. So it took us five shows to get that. But the show is never finished. It's always evolving because it's a clown show. You know, it's, we always say it's, it's a cabaret, but it needs musical theatre values. So it needs high tech, great sound. Um, but it has to respond, respond to the audience that's there. So that means, you know, I've had so many unexpected things happen. I've had, you know, audience members want to get up and sing on stage. I've had, you know, had people have heart attacks in the audience, not because of our show, because that was going to happen, but you have to flex and respond. So in a sense, the show is always evolving. It's always shifting. And I don't really want to do work that is the same every night. I mean, I, I know I will get terribly bored and I will malfunction if I have to do exactly the same thing, you know, with no no deviation at all. Yeah. It's just that thing of, of the clown being, you know, and I've seen clowns do Chekhov. You can do Chekhov, you can do the same text every night, mm -hmm. but the clown has to be alive and awake yeah. to what's happening in the moment. And if there was one place you could take this show, where would it be? Oh, Kate Bush's living room. <laughs> no, um, that's a really good question. Where would I take the show? I don't, I don't know if there's anywhere on the hit list. I mean, I would love to take it into Europe because on her brief tour of life, which was the only tours that she did, you know, before this massive gap, you know, she toured um, Germany. There's a lot of love for her in European countries. And I have vaguely been toying with the idea of translating the show into French and doing it in Paris and uh, a few other places. But to me, it's, if the audience want to see it, then we'll bring it. And what advice would you have for anyone that wants to uh, start doing a solo show or work in a theatre piece? See work, see other people's work. You've got to nourish yourself. Um, I run uh, with Victoria Melody. We have an online uh, solo theatre makers collective for female and female identifying artists. And that's been a great resource for people to share creative thoughts, but also to share about producing and being a solo traveler on the road. 
Um, I never did any courses. They didn't exist. Or if they did, I certainly didn't know about them. But there are lots of wonderful people like Katie Shoot and Bryony Kimmings who run courses. I run courses. Russell Lucas runs courses. He's also got a great book called 300 Thoughts for Theatre Makers. And they're really brilliant provocations about what theatre is and theatre can be. And a lot of younger performers will say, well, I can't make it because I don't have the funding. We've ne I've never had the funding. I've never had a Arts Council funding. I've never had... Um, you know, someone say, here's a pot of money, make a show. So it's always been born out of what can I make with minimal resources? And the fact that we are now, you know, sometimes playing six, seven, eight hundred seater venues is astonishing mm -hmm. because the show started off in the living room. So I think the other thing is just do it, just make something. Mm -hmm. And if you making something is just you in your front room and you invite your neighbour around to see it, mm -hmm. the act of presenting and, and removing that fear of it's got to be perfect before I present it. So get up and make something, tell some story. But I also think, you know, you, you're constantly composting, you're constantly absorbing information. So for a long time before even getting into a rehearsal room, I will have notebook after notebook after notebook, loads of post-it notes around and loads of thoughts. And the other thing is, is get a collaborator, get an outside eye. So even if you work a lot on your own, having someone be there who can be in place of the audience. I mean, with Russell and I, we obviously, we were in separately wound up in making this but I have made shows where I've done a lot of work on my own and then had someone come in and just and actually um, Russell's show um, Bobby Kennedy experience he made a lot of that on his own and then I came in at certain points during the process and was his outside eye and his director so it, you have to fit the right production team and the right um, mechanism for your story so I have a show called The Silent Treatment and my director, Shauna Jones, was brilliant at being my director. But prior to that, we also brought in a movement coach for a few sessions. And, you know, you might just bring in a puppeteer for one afternoon. So I think with solo work, especially, you can really cherry pick which kind of collaborators you need for that work. And what impact has this show had on you and your life? Um, it's made me love what I do even more. I think pre-pandemic, like a lot of actors... You sometimes question what you're doing. And I think, you know, I do work with other people. I was in Showstopper for 10 years and I've done conventional theatre projects. But when you do a lot of solo work, I'd run into, and Mark Fowley and I've talked about this before, you run into kind of an old version of yourself that thinks that outside um, sort of validation is what it's about. And then during the pandemic, I had this kind of realisation and sort of renewed respect for the work that I make and that I get to choose the stories that I tell and I think this show is the perfect alchemy of my loves you know which is music and improvisation and cabaret and dance and puppetry so it's given me a really wonderfully nourishing place to to hang out but it reminds me every show to reset the dial back to zero and to walk out with no expectations because the risk of it going wrong mm -hmm. I have faith in the show but there are genuinely moments where I am on the ropes and I don't know if it's going to work. And so far, touch wood, it has worked. <laughs> but I like that invitation to, well, not to take things for granted as a performer. Thank you very much for your time today. It was my pleasure.